So what are EPDs? EPDs uh, are basically values that predict the genetic merit of the animal. So we're going to use an example here of weaning weight. So we, we take a weaning weight observation on our ranch. From, an, from a selection decision standpoint, we have to realize that that weaning weight observation is made up of many different components. Okay? There is a very large uh, environmental component, and as well as a very large uh, genetic component. Um, so the, the environmental component, that winning weight observation is taken on one year. Is your environment ever the exact, exact same from year to year? It never is. So that component of that winning weight observation, we cannot utilize it to make a decision on what that animal is going to do in the future. We've got to identify the genetic component. Uh, and then through that, through our EPD calculations, we're able to identify the genetics that impact that winning weight observation, and we ultimately calculate a winning weight EPD for that animal. This is the this, this is the backbone of EPD calculations is the power uh, to determine how much of an observation is due to environment and how much of it is due to genetics. Okay, so how do we use EPDs? This is, I mean, this is a foundation foundation uh, example of how we utilize EPDs. EPDs are used to compare two animals. That is, that's, that is what they are designed to be used for. So we've got an example here, bull A and bull B. Bull A went away to 70, bull B went away to EPD at zero. So based on those EPDs, we would expect the difference between the average weaning weight of bull A's progeny um, and the average weaning weight of bull B's progeny the difference would be 70 pounds. Okay, that is how you use EPDs. We cannot, we cannot say that well, bull A's, bull A's uh, progeny, um, he's a 70. Those calves weighed 600. Next year, you know, if I use this 80 weaning weight bull, his calves are going to weigh more than that because again, we come back to the environmental component. And we just, we cannot the environment. The environment changes from one year to the next, even on the same operation. So we're pretty much, I mean, we overload our commercial producers with information. Most of the commercial producers see all this information, and there's a lot of them that say, well, this is too much. They just chunk the catalog and they go out and look at the books. Okay. So a better strategy though is to identify the the information that is presented in the cell catalog and identify which information is going to increase or enhance the profitability of those commercial operations. So what effects, so as you think about that question, what, what affects uh, your customer's profitability? Okay, and whatever that commercial guy's out there buying a bull, he's thinking he's going to be using that bull and he's going to be selling to offspring. Okay, so does that animal that they're looking at, does that animal's pedigree affect his profitability? No. Does that animal's own performance, whether it be actual or adjusted weights or ratios, does that increase or enhance or deteriorate the profitability to the commercial producer? No, we're not selling this animal. We're selling progeny of this animal. So we've got to identify what genetics this animal has to pass on to its offspring. Okay? So that is what we see in EPDs. I don't know why it has one across each one of those. Things. So we're, we're identifying the genetics that that animal can transmit to their progeny to have an impact on the profitability of that commercial producer, and that will have an impact on that commercial producer's profitability. So as we, as we go down through, and as we go down through, we'll try to go through these pretty quick. Weights are just, I mean, simple, but uh, they're weights. <coughs> adjusted weights, we adjust weighted weights, turn five days of age, you're on a weight to 365. Uh, we adjust the weights for age of dam. We know that if 
a, a calf born out of a two-year-old female uh, versus a five-year-old female, there's going to be some differences in the weight of that calf that is due simply to that dam's age. Uh, so we adjust for those things in the, adjust, in the adjustment. But you still cannot compare those adjusted weights across her with any contemporary groups uh, because of changes in, in environment and management. Ratios, simple, I mean, all ratios do, all, the only thing that ratios um, do is they place those adjusted weights on a scale averaging 100. That's all that it, it is. A, it is nothing more uh, than a different different presentation of the adjusted weight. Um, ratios can only be used to compare kids within the same contemporary group. They I would argue that they do a pretty poor job of doing that because uh, that ratio does not account for the genetics of the siren dam. The only way that we can account for mating bias, um, as well as many other things, is through the EPD calculations. So that EPD, cal that EPD provides you with a tool that you can compare across herds, that accounts for mating bias, that accounts for environmental, um, accounts for management differences. Okay, this is the gold standard. So here, here's our growth EPDs. We'll run through the EPDs that we calculate right quick. Uh, here's growth, your standard, you know, so these EPDs we've had since since the early 80s. Uh, birth, weaning, yearling, milk, all of these are presented in pounds. Um, Cavanese direct uh, Cavities direct uh, expresses the percent difference of kids unassisted at birth. Uh, so if, if you're selecting a bull to use on heifers, this is the best EPD for you to use. Uh, Cavities direct, and what we calculate it with is cavity scores and birth weights. Um, we know that those two, those two observations are what ultimately determines if you know results in unassisted or assisted births, and that is expressed in a percent. Cavity's maternal, a uh, percent difference of those daughters uh, calving unassisted. So this is the daughter's component of that. Uh, so if we are, you know, if we're identifying a bull that we know that we're going to keep daughters out of, uh, then we want a bull that's really good for cavity's maternal because that the, that bull's daughters would have genetics that would allow her to calve unassisted. Heifer pregnancy is Red Angus fertility EPD. Uh, it, heifer pregnancy, probability of an animal's daughters conceiving to calve at two years of age. Okay, So we would require those females that are exposed to ultimately result in a calving observation. Uh, stability. Stability is probability of an animal's daughters remaining productive in the herd until six years of age. So this is your longevity EPD. And what we do require Red Angus is we require those females not to just have a calf at, at two years of age and then come back at six years of age and have a calf. We require them to have a calf every year. If they enter into the herd by having a calf as a two-year-old, if she ever misses a calf or if somebody tries to roll her around to the next season, we, we treat that as a failed observation. We treat that as that female failed to conceive, and she gets negative observation. So stability allows you to reduce replacement rate, so you, you reduce the number of females that you have to bring back into the herd um, because of you know, cows that you're calling out. Um, reduce your average cow herd costs and ultimately increase profit. Cargus EPD is pretty standard. Uh, Codger, we added fuel grade and uh, added fuel grade carcass weight here just a few years ago. Um, so otherwise, pretty standard carcass EPDs. We do utilize actual carcass data plus ultrasound carcass data and the calculation of those two cover those five EPDs. So I want to talk just a little bit about DNA right, and, and talk a little bit about how Red Angus is incorporated or utilizes DNA. So ultimately, the goal of DNA technology is to le leverage that technology to achieve greater 
and faster accuracy of EPDs uh, for seed stock animals, especially in those traits that are very difficult to measure, expensive to measure, or takes a long time to measure. So BIF accuracy. Um, this is something that I would admit that we have done a very poor job of explaining in the past. We have not focused much on educating what accuracy is, and therefore most most producers, you know, they, they really don't have a really good understanding of accuracy. They know that if I use the high accuracy bull, then you know his EPDs aren't going to change around much. But other than that, really don't you know they don't have a good feel for accuracy. So these next set of slides, I want to just take you through a prime example. This this is going to be kind of a lifetime of a particular bull. Um, and then we're going to throw in some molecular breeding values to show you what that does to accuracy. So if we treat this, if we treat the, the circle, the pie graph here is, is accuracy. And if we filled that white space completely up with colored information, that would indicate that the corresponding EPD is 100 or 99.9% .9 accurate in predicting that animal's genetic merit. Okay. So if we fill up all that white, then we leave everything unanswered, and we know what the genetics of that animal are. So as you can tell right now, we've got an EPD for him, but we're very we're not we're not extremely accurate in describing it because we don't have a whole lot of information. In this example, we have a calf that is pedigree average. So we don't have maybe this is win away EPD. This calf is just born, all we know is the average of the siren dam. So that accuracy is roughly about a 0.1, a P, used to, what we used to say is a P. So then that cap comes along and we get an own, own, own uh, performance observation on that cap. So we've got more data. We've got more data to calculate the EPD. So we calculate the EPD and ultimately we express that new data uh, through a jump in the accuracy. So now we've got pedigree average, we've got pedigree information plus the owner information. We've jumped that accuracy up to 0.23 in this example. That animal goes on to become a parent. And now in this, in, in this slide, that animal has become the parent of 13 progeny who have observations for the trait we're calculating here. Um, so now that animal's accuracy has jumped up to 0.4. So now, you know, whenever you first get that first calf crop in, you've all seen a bull, I mean, a bull can fall out of bed. Or a bull can go just completely a hell of a lot better than you ever dreamed he would be. Or he may, not, he may stay the same. But we really don't know until we get that first calf crop in, right? So the power of, of genomic technology, genomic data, to see that 13 progeny, we can replace that with genomic test. Okay? So now then, let's backtrack. Let's backtrack. Now then, we've got this calf's own pedigree information, and we just now got, maybe maybe we just got ultrasound data. And then we included the molecular reading value. So this is, this could be the accuracy of 0.4 we could have accuracy of 0.4 in the kids that we're selling to our commercial, to our commercial producer. Okay, that's the power of genomic information. To be able to provide your commercial producers with more reliable genetic selection tools uh, for them to use their selection decisions. Okay, so now one point I do want to, to express is Here's here's two here's the it could, be, it could be the same app. We're still over on the left. We've got 13 progeny we're using to get to that accuracy of 0.4. On the right, we're using an MBV to get to 0.4. There's there's no difference in them, is there? We're still explaining the same amount of information. So this tells us that there's nothing magical about genomic information. Jason's not throwing anything at me, but. There's nothing magical about it. We're, we're getting the same amount of data, whether it be through 13 progeny or if it's through a molecular breeding value. In the case of molecular breeding value, we just gained that information a heck of a lot quicker and a heck of a lot cheaper than over on the left with 13 progeny. 
So let's, let's go ahead and follow this animal on through to make another point. If you notice, if you notice that tan line, it just shrunk. Uh, because now we've got in blue, we've got molecular breeding value, and also in the green, we've got 13 progeny. So this particular animal is that calf that after we got the molecular breeding value, we thought, yeah, this bull's good enough to go ahead and use in our operation. So now we followed that molecular breeding value up with even more information through, through, through 13 head of progeny. Now we've jumped that accuracy up to 0.46. We've got more information on progeny. Therefore, we're subtracting a little bit of the influence of that pedigree from that animal's EPD. Okay? We can get more information and we can do a better job in predicting an animal's genetic merit through measuring his progeny than continuously staying dead set on the pedigree. So we're going to adjust that EPD more for its own progeny and subtract a little bit from that pedigree average. Now then we've jumped this calf up to 30 head of progeny. Now then, that animal's own performance just got reduced in its impact in that EPD calculation, right? So now we've got 700 head of progeny. Now what happened? Now then, the pedigree average is diminished, the own performance is, per is diminished, and ultimately the molecular breeding value is diminished, okay? And to be truthful with you, I'm probably being a little bit generous. The pedigree average probably should be about the size of that white piece of that pie chart. Okay. and the other one should be a little bit smaller. We can gain more information, we can do a better job of predicting an animal's genetic merit through measurement of its offspring as compared to anything else to include genetic information. The genomic <coughs> information does, the, does an outstanding job of giving us a jump start and explaining that animal's genetic merit, but ultimately we follow that up with progeny information. Okay. The molecular breeding value can only explain a certain amount of genetic variation uh, to where whenever we have all of 700 head of progeny, we can do a better job of explaining those genetics. 